Hi, I'm Francesca, if I haven't met you before, and we're going to be reading from Deuteronomy um, chapter 10, starting at verse 12 and going down to verse 22. Um, and if you've got one of the church Bibles, you can find that on page 184. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine, and our second Bible reading comes from Philippians um, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Um, and that's on page 1170. Starting from verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Well, whether or not we've met, my name is Tim. Don't you find that a bit funny when we all get up, get up here and say, uh, if we haven't met, my name's Tim. Uh, and it is a great pleasure to be able to open Philippians with you. Uh, in case you're wondering what I'm doing here, I'm a part-time assistant minister. And if we haven't met, I would like to meet you. And I'll be hanging around at, at supper time. We've come to the second half of Philippians. And uh, Paul begins again with a keynote of joy 
if you've got a Bible in front of you, have it open because I don't want you to be just saying oh, whatever Tim says is right. Compare what I'm saying with what the scriptures say. And Nadia's got some notes for us. Thank you, Nadia, for that. Uh, this is actually the 10th time that Paul has mentioned joy in this letter. Verse 1, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And you'd think he'd be getting to the end, but actually he's just halfway through. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. This is what the letter's about. And you know, you don't have to be a Marie Kondo to know that there are so many things that steal joy away from us. But here in verse 1, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. And we shouldn't say that, you know, rejoice in the Lord, but rather rejoice in the Lord. That's Paul's point. That is, unlike Marie Kondo, who invites you to find anything that sparks joy, Paul's discovered the joy that comes from no one else other than Jesus. Christ Jesus is the secret of happiness, Christian happiness. And the Apostle wants the believers in Philippi, and everyone who reads this, like including us tonight, to, to come to know what he knows and to glory in Christ Jesus. Because something's happened to Paul. And you might feel like you know him, but Philippians reveals quite a bit about the internal workings of this guy, Paul. He's found this inexhaustible supply of joy and not even prison or the threat of execution can take it away, let alone a little clutter in your household. And this joy doesn't depend on what ethnic group you come from or what country you're from or your economic status or your love life or whether your team won today, mine didn't. He tells us what the source of joy is actually, verses 7 to 8, have a look at it. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Something drastic has taken hold of Paul. So that all the things he previously sparked joy for him, that he thought important, all his carefully curated credentials, all his achievements in front of his peer group, he regards them as a hindrance and as we'll see in a minute, even as manure. All his certificates and accomplishments, all he'd worked for in his former way of life, all that he'd tuned his life to achieve, they've now become a millstone around his neck. See, when you see it, the worth of Jesus and everything changes. All those things that used to control us, all those things that still threaten to control us and steal our joy away. They are nothing compared to knowing Christ. Now, I like camping. And one of the things you need to do from time to time is uh, get a new tent. Right? And the way you know you need to get a new tent um, is to go into the tent when it's sunny right? and, and, and look at the roof. And uh, you need to replace your tent if what you see is all these pinpricks of light coming through because the next time you're in your tent and it's raining, it won't just be light that's coming through. And what, what Paul's saying here is that all those things that gave us joy in our previous way of life, before we saw Christ for who he truly is, they're like the tiny pinpricks of light when you're in that old tent and you look at the roof. But when the light of Christ arises in your heart, and outshines them all. It's like leaving the tent and going into the, the sunlight of the, the full brightness of the sun during day, the brilliant light. And so living seeking those pinpricks of joy, it's almost nothing compared to the light of Christ. I even get in the way. Have a look at verse 8b. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So the big question today as we look at this passage together is what is it about Jesus Christ that makes him outstrip and transcend anything else that's good? And that's why Paul is writing this part of Philippians. He wants the Philippians to have the joy he's got because he knows Christ. So I've got two points. Firstly, how does a Christian life start? How do you actually get into this way? And then secondly, how do you stay in it? 
What does it look like in an ongoing kind of way, starting and going on? So firstly, point one, the start of the Christian life. And you see it there in verse 9, have a look at it. I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now some people here have followed Jesus for many decades and I won't ask you to identify yourself but you know who you are. Others of us, it's just a couple of weeks. And some here, I'm guessing, don't really know what I'm talking about. What is this following Jesus? You might have been searching. When you start to follow Jesus, it actually doesn't feel like you've found God. It feels like he's found you. Because you, you might have been searching what's life about, but when you meet God through coming to know Jesus, who he is, what he's done, you realise he's been making a place for you. He's been looking for you. He's been after you. And you know, you cannot make yourself a Christian. It's not, it's not like going to the gym, not like buying a gym membership and so now you're a member of the gym. Right? It's not something you take up like that. It's something that takes you up. And Paul says this start, this change comes down to two completely different, two mutually exclusive kinds of righteousness. On the one hand, the horizontal. The kind of righteousness that you can see all around us in our culture, in the world. It's my righteousness based on what I do, my accomplishments, my achievements, the, the things I do to get acceptance from other people, right, standing with other people. And you could spend a little bit of time now, you know, chatting with a person next to you, compiling a list of your accomplishments, what are the things that, you know, you've done to make people, you know, respect you... Some of us would take quite a long time to do that. And others of us might feel like we haven't achieved much in life at all. And Paul's list there in verses 4 to 6. And he even sneaks in a whole bunch of things that actually he had no hand in, like, you know, who he was born to, what tribe he was part of. And we do that too, don't we? Well, that's one kind of righteousness, horizontal righteousness, self-made righteousness. And we might feel it more or less intensely. Well, let me tell you, our tech is geared towards it and it it amplifies and and addicts us to the constant approval of others, isn't it? Well, the other kind of righteousness on view here is what Paul calls in verse 9 the righteousness of God. And we might say that's vertical righteousness. It comes to me as a gift by me trusting what Jesus did on the cross. So think about Jesus for a moment, all his love for others, his perfect obedience of his Father. Um, All the righteousness that's in Jesus, God gives that to you when you trust in what Jesus has done. Uh, So much so that I can call this righteousness my own now. That's the righteousness from God. And it's outrageous to think that I could have that righteousness for me to have it. Let me say nothing of you. Um, and, and, And it's what theologians call alien righteousness because not because it's uh, you know spooky or something like that but because it doesn't come from within me it comes from another person and it's given to me i didn't earn it i didn't work for it i didn't achieve it or pass a test it comes from god by faith through trusting his promise to give it the perfect righteousness that comes to all who trust jesus and you know I just feel like pausing there for a moment, just just settling. Because this really is the centre of the Christian message. I'm not righteous in myself, but God freely gives his righteousness to anyone who asks for it. He busted the heavenly bank to do it. This is this is the this is the sum. God would rather have his son die than you miss out on eternity with him. But you know, when you take on Jesus by faith, you actually receive a double gift. Because he, he forgives me. He, he takes away whatever it is that has soiled me. He wipes me clean, he washes me, and he grants me righteousness. His righteousness. I'm not just forgiven to go back to neutral, zero, to be able to start building up another set of achievements. And look... 
don't mistake what I'm saying. This is not saying that instantly you become obedient or instantly sinless. I mean, you would have noticed that in those who follow Jesus. They're not without sin. What Paul's saying here is that the righteousness of Christ becomes mine. It's been given to me. I don't become morally excellent in my moment-to-moment life. It's, it's a new standing, a new place that I live out of that's now mine. And there's only one way I can receive righteousness from God. I've got to abandon my self-made righteousness. And that's really Paul's point in verses 2 to 6. See, there were some new teachers coming along in Philippi who said, now Jesus is great as far as he goes, but he doesn't go far enough. You need to obey all of what the Bible says, especially that Old Testament stuff, even the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham, circumcision. And you get a sense of Paul's reaction to that in verses 2 and 3, right? I mean, following the Old Testament law, including circumcision, I don't think that's a very great temptation for most of us. But actually, it is still around in Sydney. And just this week, I heard again of another person who's been involved with a group like that. But let me tell you, it made complete sense in first century Philippi. Think about it for a moment. If you became a Christian from a Jewish background, all the privileges of your background suddenly made sense. You're even more a child of Abraham. It was kind of impossible not to feel confidence in your place, your long-term place in God's plans. And maybe even to look down on those poor old Gentiles who just had no idea. I mean, they've been worshipping things of stone and wood and things they made themselves. And we might not be tempted by that kind of grasping at righteousness. But we sure have our own forms of righteousness today. Sydney, contemporary Sydney righteousness. Uh, And I'm told those things have got less to do with who's your father than with uh, things that we perform, things that we do. I mean, I think our self-made righteousness today means being on the right side of particular issues. And it might be issues of the moment. It might be climate change. It might be increasing the jobless support payment. It might be supporting the voice or PwC getting no more government contracts. Or it might be promoting our diversity or signalling our virtue in some kind of way. And although many of those things are good in themselves and even arise out of the gospel message, we often do these things for horizontal reasons, for for fear of being shunned or being evicted from the in crowd or fear of not belonging. Because righteousness, what Paul's getting at here, righteousness, this word, it's not about being a good person Righteousness is a list of credentials that we look to for acceptance by those that we want to be accepted by. It's a right standing or a right relationship with someone. And it might be accomplishments or skills or qualifications. It's what we do to belong. I mean, if you're a bit younger here, I understand it's the look um, If you're a bit older, it's the vibe. It might be having 10,000 or 100,000 followers on Twitter or taking a break from Twitter for six months and telling everyone about it. Those things are not wrong in themselves, but they're things that we do to be in with other people. Paul had a CV to die for. Seven things that he lists in verses 4 to 6 that gave him confidence, horizontal confidence. The tribe he comes from, one of the two tribes that stays faithful to the end. And he was deeply committed to the cause. He led the killing of Christians because he and others believed they were spreading heresy. And it culminates in verse 6 in these words, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Notice, that does not mean he's claiming that he's sinless or good. But under the law, which had provision for forgiveness, he was without fault. He'd done everything he needed to do to be on the right side of the law. He had a right standing based on the law, based on what he'd done. And again, look, 
None of those things are bad in themselves, except maybe for murdering Christians, right? But the day that Paul met Jesus, his attitude to his horizontal righteousness all changed. Verse 8, I, I count all that stuff as rubbish now. Our English translation is very polite here. But the word is actually manure. I mean, that's a polite word. I mean, all of us know what Paul's getting at here. You know, you're kind of unselfconsciously, innocently walking down the street when that, you know, unmistakable, squishy feeling happens. And we realise that we've trodden in dog poo. And what's your immediate reaction? Get it off me, right? And now Paul wants this self-made righteousness off him because it keeps him from the righteousness that's found in Christ. They're incompatible, these two kinds of righteousness, the horizontal and the vertical. Verse 9, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, poop, okay, in order that I may gain Christ. Because in the end... All self-made righteousness is an attempt to play God. An attempt to control my life, to be my own saviour. A refusal of what God offers. Trying to put God in his place. Trying to put God in his debt. And that means there's a limit to what God can ask of him. But when he met Christ on the Damascus Road, the thing he'd been giving himself to, the whole self-made program, came to revolt him. Some people come to Jesus from a long way away. You know, like the prodigal son, right? Right? living a life of abandon, but most people don't. Before, before the apostle was a Christian, a follower of Jesus, he was a Pharisee, an outwardly good person, a lawyer even, and a law keeper, a responsible neighbour, and everyone knew it. When he was a Pharisee, when he sinned, he'd confess his sins, offer the sacrifices in public, and then go back to building his self-made righteousness. But when he met Christ, he understood that not only did he need to repent of his sins, he needed to repent of his self-made righteousness. The only credentials could, that could ever please God, he came to see, were Jesus Christ's, which incredibly... God is willing to give away free to anyone who asks. And that new understanding unleashed a joy in him that nothing could take away. God owed him nothing, but God gave him and God gave us what we do not deserve. But here's the thing. God will give us this single-handedly. He doesn't need our help. It's one way. It's a gift. That's what the word grace means. It's all mercy. And that is the start of the Christian life, when you get that, that he's done it for you, to take hold of that gift that he's holding out. I think one of our biggest problems in life is not a problem of morality, how to be good. See, we do not just have to repent of our sins. What the gospel shows us is that we need to repent of our self-made righteousness. And I wonder if you've done that. I wonder if you kind of regret the things that you've done in the past, but basically after you've done that you go back to making your own self-made righteousness. And I say this because that's a constant temptation, ongoing temptation. We're addicted to making our own righteousness. It's so much easier to cover up my sense of self-inadequacy through credentials and through performance. And receiving the gift of righteousness from Christ is so risky. It means there's no limit to what God can ask me to do. It means finding my life by losing my life. It's only when I choose to lose everything to Christ that I'll be found in him. And if you're still building this self-righteousness, you won't have the joy that Paul is talking about in Philippians. We cannot build our life on Christ 
and our self-made righteousness at the same time. Because our self-made righteousness doesn't bring us to Christ. Christ doesn't need to die because we're doing it ourselves. It doesn't keep us in Christ because I can do it on my own. It gradually makes something else more important than Christ, my performance. What other people think of my performance. And you know, you can build self-righteousness with anything in your life. And when you lose that thing, you're devastated. And when I receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ and I'm found in him and I've come to know him, I can be hurt and I can be discouraged, I can be betrayed and I can lose something precious. I can even say I stumble and fall. But since God accepts me in Christ Jesus and I have that righteousness from him as a gift, he still sees me in Jesus. And nothing can take away that joy. And we have to come back to this daily, friends, if we're followers of Jesus. Every day. If we're to grow in joy. This is what it means to know the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. I said we had two points. Well, secondly, and much more briefly... What does it like, look like to follow Jesus in an ongoing kind of way? How does the surpassing worth of Jesus affect us ongoingly? And the Apostle tells us, I think there's two, a two-sidedness to Christian experience. And the first is this, a radical satisfaction through knowing Christ. It's really important that we kind of get this. Some of us are pretty happy on our own, but, but most of us, I think, long for someone to know us deeply. And the national stats, I think, about relationships in Australia tell a sad story. We're not so good at intimate friendship, let alone friendship in general. I think the current discussion about AI even muddies the water even more, but we'll leave that aside. Knowing Christ and being known by him is being vulnerable to him. And it's only this... Paul's been saying that can bring us the deepest possible satisfaction. I mean, Jesus himself, think about John's Gospel, describes himself as living water, eating the bread of heaven, trusting him, knowing him, eating the bread of heaven. What does it look like to be known by him and to know him? Verse 10, Paul wants to know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And here Paul's talking about the genuine daily experience of what it is to know Christ, and what he wants to experience is the power of the resurrection. Really? Hang on, just wind back a little bit. Do you remember where Paul is when he writes this? Um, this thing he's talking about here, the power of the resurrection, that's the big power of God, you know, the, the power by which God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth and wind everything up and destroy the last enemy, death. And that, that's the power I want to know but day by day. And we, and we say, us, of course, knowing that Paul's in prison, chained up, really? Isn't there something a little more pressing, Paul? Like getting out of prison? But look at the rest of the verse. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. See, when Paul describes what it's like to follow Jesus, it's, it's becoming like Jesus. He's talking about being, becoming increasingly like Christ. This is Paul's goal. Being formed into Christ, into the likeness of Christ, specifically being like Christ in his death. So, Knowing Jesus in his resurrection doesn't mean we'll all become super spiritual or, you know, suddenly become super moral and never make any mistakes or sin ever again. It's not that we'll have superlative wisdom or insight or wealth. It's that we're made to be like him. Daily suffering to be forged into his image. Do you see it there? Because... I constantly want to go back to my credentials and dust them off and get a bit of confidence through them. But the power to keep going, Paul says, is this. The power to keep trusting Christ and not ourselves, 
to keep praying when my gut reaction is to think, oh, I, I, if I only I did this, I could fix it, or I don't really feel like praying, or the, the power to treat others better than myself. That only comes out of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. That is the first sign of ongoing Christian maturity, a, a total satisfaction with Jesus. I'm not looking to the other stuff. It's coming to this satisfaction in him. But there's a second marker here, I think, as well. If the first is radical satisfaction with Jesus, the other is radical dissatisfaction with where I'm at at the moment. It's the sense that you know there's more. See, once you taste the living water, you want more. This is, this is the best sort of hunger and thirst and dissatisfaction. Once you come to experience his grace and know that you can trust him with your deepest failure, your greatest fear. Well, you want more. You, you want more of his mercy. You can't get enough of his goodness. He loved me even though I'm like that. <laughs> he emptied himself for us. Humbled himself to death on a cross. For us. I mean, you might think at this point in Paul's missionary career, he could put his feet up and rest a bit, because he's got a pretty impressive track record. He's met Christ face to face, he's preached across the Roman Empire, He suffered not a little bit for Christ, but the surpassing worth of knowing Christ drives him on in his dissatisfaction, in his quest for more. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained this or, or uh, am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. But friends, if you're like me, the past keeps on rearing its ugly head. And in verses 13 to 14, Paul finishes with a really, really helpful pointer. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own. And one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here's Paul's goal in life, and this is so helpful to me personally. The way we press on, the ongoingness of the Christian life is this. Is to forget what lies behind. All your successes and your credentials, your sins and your failures. I've got a lot of sins and failures in my life. We could spend a lot of time talking about them later. But Paul says here, forget them. We all know what it's like to live life looking over our shoulder, don't we? Paralysed sometimes by guilt or regret or thinking about your past glories. The roar of the crowd as you're stretched for the try line. But the key to moving forward in Christ is forgetting what lies behind and focusing again on the surpassing worth of Christ and the righteousness that God alone gives to anyone who asks for it. It's hunting Christ. In John's Gospel, Jesus offers himself to, to us in this whole bunch of word pictures, the water of life, the gate, the shepherd, the bread of life, the resurrection and the life. And when we come to taste Jesus, it is the best thing. And we know it's thirst quenching. And we don't want to go back to that toxic water, that bitter water of our own righteousness. But you know, every one of those pictures is, is about the ongoing, daily, recurring experiences in this life. You don't get Jesus as a one-off vaccination. It's a constant drinking and feeding and receiving and grasping Him. The start and the ongoing. Rejoice in that Lord. I think we're going to pray, is that right?